Lecturer Dr. David Willer, Professor of Sociology of the University of Kansas. Uh, Dr. Willer graduated from Purdue University in 1964 with a PhD in Sociology. He has held various, various professorships at some distinguished universities, including a sabbatical at Stanford University in California. California. Dr. Willer's areas of expertise in sociology and social theory, a theory, a theory construction and a history of theory, particularly Marx and Baker, methodology, such as the logic of the scientific method, social stratification, mathematical sociology, exchange theory, and network theory. Uh, Dr. Willer has an impressive data, including many books and, and articles, research grants. Uh, these also include a forthcoming book, which we're very excited about, Social Exchange and Exchange Networks with Bo Anderson. Uh, Dr. Willer's talk this evening is entitled, Why Rome Fell, or Theory, Experimentation, and the Prospects for Historical Explanation. Dr. Willer. I hope you'll all pardon me. I'm an inveterate smoker, and I will probably be puffing away here and if it irritates anybody for goodness sake, tell me. I had a we went through two titles for this talk, and I thought of another one. Uh, after Why Rome Fell, I thought we could subtitle it. Or why do we think that we can know why Rome fell? Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm only going to talk about the Roman Empire in the West. And before I really get talking, I ought to say that I'm absolutely delighted to be here. AKD is very dear to my heart. I'm an old akd -er. It was the first academic honor I ever got. And it was wonderful to get it, and it boosted my ego immensely. And I've tried to stay active ever since. And it's very much a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm only going to talk about the Roman Empire in the West. The Roman Empire in the East, completely different system, and if we want to try to get into that later on in the questions, perhaps I can say a few completely uninformed things about it, because I don't know that much about it, but I could at least give it a shot. What I want to talk about tonight concerns a number of areas. Why Rome fell is a problem in theory. It's a problem in theoretic interpretation. It's just there are problems of method involved in it. It's a problem of understanding social structure as well as a problem of straightforward historical fact. Now, I need to add some disclaimers at the outset. For the student of ancient history, I'm not going to introduce any new facts. I'll follow Weber, I'll sell, follow A.G.M. Jones, I'll follow Bernardi on taxes, Parker on military, things, and I won't say that much about the military. For sociologists, I won't have any new stages of history. I'll follow the standard Marx day, Weber stages of history, and thus, in discussing Rome, I'll be thinking of it in terms of the state property stage of antiquity and how, in the West, this moved to feudalism. For the philosophers of science, I won't present a new method. The method that I'll use here, and to a large extent use implicitly, follows from Toulmin, my reading of uh, Toulmin, my reading of Galileo, and a few thoughts of my own. It's my idea, at least, of how you do a scientific interpretation. There, there will be a few new theoretic formulations. The network models that I'll use for interpretation might be a little different from things you've seen in the past. These models are drawn in light of a new social theory, which includes three components. Central to this social theory is a modeling procedure. You see sort of pieces of it up there with little pluses and minuses, arrows and circles, and those are only just pieces, and I'll only be talking about them in the most general possible way. Tomorrow, when I talk about the issue of what is exact theory, I will try to go into some detail on the issue of how I see theory and how this particular theory works. Tonight I'll be using it interpretively, and I think you'll fall into how it works in, as I go along. So central to this theory is a modeling procedure. There is al there are also a calculus and principles to it, too. Those won't be mentioned tonight. They'll be used implicitly. 
One of the things I'll be talking about, and this will come later on in the hour, is the issue of strong structure. Strong structure. A strong structure is a kind of system of social relationships which, if you have the right conditions, the right theoretic conditions for social actors, results in a determination of behavior. It also has a propensity to create certain kinds of actor conditions. So we'll talk about, and you'll see a little bit more, what the, the idea of strong structure means as we go in. Fundamental to what I want to talk about tonight is the issue of systems of interaction, social structures, and how they reproduce themselves. And of course, it's a simply a historical fact that the Roman Empire in the West did not reproduce itself, but instead went through a period of transition, the result of which, at least in some parts of the empire, was classical feudalism. There are fundamentally two, as I understand it, two explanations for the fall of Rome, or at least two that are in vogue now. One of them is Max Weber's explanation. Now, I will actually follow that one pretty closely. According to Max Weber, the Roman Empire in the West fell because it was a slave system. As Weber put it, ancient civilization used up slaves just as a modern blast furnace uses up coal. As long as the Roman Empire expanded, it was stable. Because in, an, in its expansion, it was able, through military conquest, to provide a sufficient supply of slaves for the very l large and increasingly growing estates in the countryside. When it stabilized, the slave population declined, and so did Rome. Now, that's the sense of Weber's argument. I'll add something to that. There's a second argument put forward by Jones and Bernardi. And that was that Rome fell because of the high levels of taxation that occurred between the 3rd and 5th centuries AD. I think that that argument is fundamentally also sound and has much to be said for it. In fact, in some areas and under certain circumstances, the rates of taxation were much higher in the 3rd to 5th century than they were in the 1st century. In other cases, though, they were lower. So one has to be very careful and qualify the Bernardi argument, and I'll try to do that as I go on. Let me begin my discussion strictly descriptively. Let's look at classical Rome and some of the most important prevailing conditions around the first century AD and discuss this system in its most general sense. Of course, as you know, by that time, Rome effectively dominated the Mediterranean, and in fact, at, it was at that point that it was, that it was completing its expansion away from the Mediterranean. Now, this is important for a number of reasons. As Rome expanded, particularly on the northern side of the Mediterranean, and particularly as it expanded into Greece, it was able to enslave populations that in many regards were like its own. So that the slaves were not simply people of who were in a sense and the, well, the Romans like to call everyone barbarians except themselves, of course. But they were not uneducated. It was possible to have very cheap doctoring if you had a Greek doctor who was a slave for you. Rome, thus, with its military advantage, and I won't go into that, was able to have the advantage of gaining skilled and unskilled labor as long as it expanded throughout the Mediterranean area. It expanded away from it. It was able still to fill the, the slave estates in the countryside to its unskilled labor. But by the first century AD, things were not looking as good because where else could Rome expand? Rome did expand to Britain, of course. But in fact, they didn't make what we would call today any profit from Britain. The reason for that was obvious. It just was too far to ship things. At this point, the expansion was coming to an end, but slaves were yet cheap. The coercive exploitation of slaves in the estates could be seen in the following kind of way. Rome was an urban civilization. From, this, from the large estates in the countryside, 
through coercive relations that flowed to the cities various kinds of material. Now, if we're talking here about the very largest estates, then we're talking about things like oil, wine, beef, not wheat. Wheat was usually grown by small, small, almost a peasant class in the countryside. This flow of material goods went to the household of the master. From there, some was used, and some entered then into the urban marketplace in exchange for other needs of the master's household. So the exchange city, excuse me, the exchange system in the city was linked to the surplus of the master's household. The larger the surplus beyond the needs of those in the master's household, the greater the rate of exchange in the urban marketplace. The less and the less the rate of exchange. Both land and the urban economy were taxed in money to support the legions and also to support a growing civil bureaucracy. But at this point, as I mentioned before, the tax rates were low. And as I mentioned before, the slaves were not reproducing themselves. The slaves lived a barracks life in, in most instances. They were marched to work and marched home again. Milled under, lived under quasi-military discipline. And in effect, I think you can understand the system by realizing that the life expectancy of a slave was something like 32, 33 years. They were worked to death. They could be afforded, and Rome could afford that because these were, in fact, outsiders. Nevertheless, the estate in the countryside was self-supporting. That is, the estate, the large estates, were not themselves engaged in exchange relations with the urban system. They shipped surpluses to the urban system, which were in fact extracted by coercion. Now let's look at some of the prevailing conditions of the fourth to the fifth century of decadent Rome. But in the fourth and fifth centuries, the boundaries of the empire were still being maintained. They were becoming permeable, but they were still being maintained. The tax rate was up, but the tax base had been reduced. Large landowners, in cooperation with members of the bureaucracy, the civil administrative bureaucracy, who also very often were land, large landowners, had been able to escape from taxes, to choose the area that they would pay their taxes in or not to pay taxes at all. So, so the taxes were felt more and more heavily upon the poorer classes. This was the, ins this was the institution of particium. Parti my Latin's terrible. Particinum. Oh, forget it. The protection of large estates from taxation and also from military service. Skilled labor of the cities began at this time to escape to the estates. City populations declined. Formerly free laborers became enserfed, voluntarily enserfed themselves. At the same time, the status of slaves was increasing to that of a serf. Slaves were no longer under military discipline, usually and increasingly had their own place to live, had a family, though they were tied to the land. And at the same time, the supply of slaves was drying up of new slaves. So now we see some of the conditions of Rome in the first century AD, in the fourth to the fifth century AD. The question arises, why? Why the decline of population in the cities? Why did the urban marketplaces decline and eventually completely, or almost effectively completely eliminated? Why is it this rich, network of international trade, those spun fin finally, those spun finally. Why did that dissolve? Why was it that an empire that was wealthy enough to, sh to feed most of its people in its capital city with grain grown thousands of miles away in Egypt, why, did, why could such an empire decline? 
Let me say something. Hmm. Do I need to move this now if I'm going to get this on tapes? I'll just put it over here. Now let me talk a little bit about these models. These are extremely simple models for the system. And what I want to do is interpret these models in light of what we've talked about. Think of the estates in the countryside as transferring value of goods to the household of the master in the city. The city is then made up of households of masters, lots and lots of unemployed people, artisans, <coughs> tradesmen, beer makers, in many regards not unlike a medieval village or a medieval town, but with this difference. Dominating the whole economy of the city is ultimately the household of the master. And the thing that makes the urban economy go is the surpluses from the estate brought into the city and then sold be the, the surpluses beyond the needs of the master and his household that are then sold in the urban marketplace. You can think of the urban marketplace in more or less the following kind of terms. If this, be the, if this represents the household of the master, then the surpluses in uh, meat, surpluses of wine, surpluses of oil, surpluses of the various agricultural commodities went to the urban market. Back in that urban market went money. But with this money, various services of artisans uh, could, be, could be purchased. Various services, various foreign goods, such as silks and so forth, could be purchased. All right? The very livelihood of the foreign exchange system and of the artisan system ultimately, and the rest of the urban marketplace, ultimately rests on the rate at which these surpluses could be put into the market. Because, of course, what we have is a, is a system in which money circulates. Money, if I can draw money as a dollar bill, goes here, goes over here, goes over here, yeah, excuse me, and coming back in the other direction, the commodity has been used up. The ability of any foreign trader, any artisan, or even the master, the ability of any one of these actors to pay taxes is ultimately related to the involvement of that actor in this exchange market. That is, their ability to pay taxes in money. Now, here a little digressions in order. What I need is three more blackboards. I can't talk very long without a blackboard. Okay. One of the interesting characteristics of bureaucracies is this. Any organization that's worth being called a bureaucracy at all always has a centralized exchequer, which is to say the ultimate head of the bureaucracy always pays everybody directly. All right? So as far as, as payment is concerned, even though we have a person down here who's formally subordinate of this person and someone over here who's formally subordinate of that person, the payment doesn't flow through that actor. It goes directly to, from the central actor to the ones down below. Now, as long as you can pay the various people in a bureaucracy with money, see, I can't stretch that down quite enough, but what I'm drawing is something that's very different from the usual organization chart. That represents delegation. But if you notice, in fact, it's not your immediate boss that pays you, it's all the, the ultimate head of the organization that pays you, okay? Now that's important because it's that that makes a bureaucracy centralized and makes her a, for centralized authority that will not break apart. Ultimately, and historically, as Weber and Marx both recognized, bureaucracies have to have money or almost have to have money. There are almost no historical exceptions. And the reasons, I think, are obvious. Otherwise, consider the problem. If the ultimate head of this organization couldn't pay these people with money, he had to pay them in kind. He had to supply everything they'd need, clothing, shelter, food, each an individual thing. He'd have to have another bureaucracy in order to supply the people in this bureaucracy. OK? So to have an efficient bureaucracy at all, you've got to have money payment. That's why it's important ultimately that's ultimately why it's important that, this, that we understand the origin of the urban marketplace and what makes the urban marketplace go. Because it, even if there are surpluses in the system, if they, if they cannot be bought with money, and if taxes can't be paid in money, then ultimately it can't support a bureaucracy. 
did not support either a civil bureaucracy or a military bureaucracy. And ultimately, it was the military bureaucracy of Rome that made Rome what it was. It was, in fact, the highly disciplined legions. And the military discipline rested at least partly on the fact that it was, in fact, a highly bureaucratic bureaucratized army for its day. Now, so we see that this rate is, de is dependent ultimately on the rate of the surplus movement in terms of rate, this rate over here. If this rate slows down, there's problems in supporting the bureaucracy. So let's go back and look at the rate and look at the system in the estate <coughs> and try to understand why one or another rate of coercion might have been possible at one or another historical stage. Because if we can account for changes in the rate of coercion in the countryside, then we can account for changes in this flow rate. If there is reason to suppose this flow rate went down at some historical period, then of course that would affect the amount of surplus. There might not be any surplus beyond the needs of the master's household which would, of course, destroy the urban economy. And that's, in fact, what I'm going to argue. Let's look at it. What I have here is a very simple coercive model. What we have, it's, of course, not even historically accurate, but I will go back and see if we can cover that later on. We have a mass who stands in coercive relationships with a set of slaves. I only drew three. There, he has three, you can put in slaves. The nature of a coercive relationship is that work will be done by the slave. And, re and the result of that work, beyond sub the subsistence needed for the slave, will be transmitted to the master. The question is how much work is going to be done and how much is going to be left here? What will be the standard of living of the slaves and how hard will they have to work? <coughs> well, the only reason that the slaves work ultimately in a system like this is not because they love their masters, but because of the whip. And that's represented by the other vector with a negative sign on it. These systems are also circumscribed. Any coercive system to work as a coercive system must be circumscribed, which is to say it must be impossible for the coerced actor to escape, or effectively impossible. Now, I want to talk about this system under two different conditions. One condition I want to talk about this system under is one in which there is, in fact, a slave market represented here by these two slaves, one of which has these little dotted lines represents the possibility of moving this slave, or ultimately this slave, into this system. So one condition I want to talk about is when there is a slave market, and the other, of course, is when there isn't. And I want to ask the question, what the existence of a slave market, and what the significance of the existence of a slave market is, vis-a-vis the rate of coercion that's possible in this kind of a system. Before I do that, I ought to make a disclaimer. I've left out the administrative structure of the estate. And I'll be glad to come back and talk about that later on. In fact, as, you, as we already know, the master didn't live on the estate at all. He lived in the city. So this really isn't the master, but the master's representative himself, a slave. And in fact, there was a hierarchy of slaves. Nevertheless. The argument I'll give here will still hold under those conditions. It doesn't matter if you add those or not. In fact, it will strengthen it. But we'll come back to that later on if you'd like. Whether this be the master then or the master's representatives for this argument will not matter as long as, in fact, this actor is, is for the most part, representing the interest of the master. Let's look, at this let's look at the system, first of all, under the conditions in which there is a slave market. All right. And the thing I want to look at is the issue of confrontation. Now, what do I mean by confrontation? Ultimately, as you can tell, there's an, there are opposed interests in this system. It's perfectly clear that the master wants as much work as possible and wants the slaves to consume as little as possible. The slaves want to work as little as possible and want to consume as much, much as possible. How is this opposition of interest to be resolved? Will it be resolved wholly in the interest of the master, wholly in the interest of the slave, or will there, in fact, be a compromise? Now, by saying there's a compromise, I don't mean to imply that there was an actual bargaining relationship and a contract was written. All right? 
Nevertheless, anyone who's tried ever to get anybody else to work knows that compromises occur quite apart from whether you bargain or not. And the, the amount of labor one gets from someone is not necessarily a maximum or a minimum. Ultimately, it can be related to structural conditions. And now I want to talk about structural conditions. All right. What is cost of confrontation? Confrontation, well, excuse me. Let's presume for a moment that a disagreement existed between the master and one of the slaves over how hard a slave should work. You know what is going to happen. The master is going to beat the slave, or at least going to think about beating the slave. That's the condition of confrontation. In short, in this system, it's the transmission of that vector that's the negative, the negative sanction. So the condition of confrontation is a transmission of a negative sanction. And what we need to ask is this. What are the costs of the transmission of that negative sanction, and what are the costs of its reception? Well, we already know what the costs of reception are. They're terrible. In fact, as you know, any slave-owning class makes it, a, makes it their business to make it really terrible when you're deviant and you don't work if you're a slave. But that doesn't mean that the costs of its transmission are negligible. That does not mean that it's completely costless to beat a slave. If there isn't a slave market, you might kill him. And if you kill him, you will lose all of his labor for the rest of his life, and you won't be able to replace him. If there is a slave market, the cost of killing a slave is the cost of buying a new slave. So the cost of confrontation for the master is ultimately the cost of new slaves. If those slaves are available, the greater the market, the cheaper the slaves, the lower the cost of confrontation. The smaller the slave market, the more expensive the slaves, the, the higher the cost of confrontation. Remembering that the cost of confrontation for the slaves is exactly the same all the way through. Now let's consider hypothetically the kinds of rules that a master could institute that might maximize the rate of coercion. And by that, I mean minimize the consumption of the slaves and maximize their work. And it seems to me that the maximal rule that the, that the master could use would look something like this, that the slave that worked least hard would always be beaten over a given period of time. Let me, let me state the rule again. The slave who worked least hard would always be beaten. There's an analogous rule in a business system. The worker who works least hard is fired. Okay. Now, consider what that rule does vis-a-vis -vis the slaves. Even though each of these slaves has an interest in working less hard than any other slave, they also have an interest in avoiding the negative sanction. Under that condition of rule, if this slave knows how hard these slaves are working, then if that, and he's working less hard, immediately generates an interest in working harder. Right? If he believes the rule. That, work, that slave then works harder. The other slaves realize that, that this other slave is working harder, and this one happens now to be the least hard working slave. He then has an interest in working harder. That leaves this one. And he gets beat. And then he has an interest in working harder the next day. Now, it seems to me that, in, that as that kind of a rule is applied, ultimately you get the highest possible rates of coercion and that there's no other rule that I can imagine that would give you rates of coercion that would be maximal. But notice one thing. It isn't good enough just to make a rule like that. You've got you to follow through on it. That is, you have to have veracity. People have to believe you. 
What if a master lined up all the slaves and said, look, I've got a rule, and the rule is this, that the laziest one of you blankety blanks out there is going to get beaten, and then nobody ever gets beaten. He's not going to be believed. That is, ultimately, he's going to have to follow through on that rule. Now, the next question is, under what kind of conditions can he follow through? And I think the answer is this, only when the costs of confrontation are low enough that he can afford to do it which means only under the conditions in which the extra output that he's getting by using that rule, which I think is the maximal rule, is greater than the cost of this, that it takes to replace those slaves. If slaves have become massively expensive or, and or they just simply aren't available anymore, that rule becomes irrational because the rate of coercion will be very high until all the slaves are expended and that's it. So it's an irrational rule under those conditions. Now, let's look at one other thing. What happens then? What kind of rule can the master institute? When, in fact, there are no surplus slaves. It seems to me that he can bluff a lot. It seems to me that he can actually hurt people some. And it seems to me he can make their life miserable. But none of this is sufficient to completely oppose the interests of all of the slaves to each other. In fact, you can see how they might even want to collude a little bit so that, in fact, the maximal production would not, in fact, occur. In fact, it seems to me that some kind of compromise will occur. Of course, the ability to coerce will result in the generation of surplus work, surplus product for the master, but nothing like as high as before. Now let's look at Rome. As long as Rome expanded, there was a surplus of slaves. As long as there's a surplus of slaves, a high rate of coercion was theoretically possible. And in fact, as far as we can tell, occurred. The flow of material goods from the countryside into the city was maximal. The rate of exchange in the urban economy was as high as it could be given the technology that they had, given the usual kind of slippages that occur in these kinds of systems. At least insofar as the rate of coercion is concerned, it was making its maximal contribution at this point. Once Rome reached its natural limits, and I don't mean by that in any mystical sense, this is simply a question of military technology. Just as the US was not very effective in South Vietnam, Rome was not very effective in the forests of Germany, and for precisely the same reasons. Bureaucratic armies are not effective in those kinds of areas where they have to break up into small groups. Irregular armies are always much more effective. The only thing Rome, literally, the only thing that Rome could have done that I know of is to have started slowing down the Black Forest. They might have been able to do that at one point, by the way. But uh, anyway, Rome reached its natural limits. The forest in the north, the sea in the west. Point. The empire had expanded to areas where the population density was not that high. Raiding into Greece had result at one time, at a much earlier period, in bringing back many slaves. Raiding into Germany is even hard to find the people. Not, not even to speak of bringing them back. So the slave market dies out. At least in accordance with what I've discussed up to this point, it looks like what that means is that the rate of coercion will, will go down as a consequence of that. This is in fact reflected, according to Mach's favor, in the change in the legal system. In fact, at this point, slaves begin to have rights. They had no rights before. They now begin to have rights because, in fact, there is an interest on the part of the empire, at least the military and civil bureaucracy in the empire, not to kill off the lower classes. But in any case, we can see that, in fact, what we find with the decline of the empire is, in fact, the reestablishment of the family and the reestablishment of a higher standard of living for the lower classes. Here's what I think happened. 
The rate of coercion reduced. The rate of flow reduced. As that flow reduced, the rate of circulation of money in the, in the urban economy was reduced. As that was reduced, it became more and more difficult to pay taxes in money. Thus, the large landowners would escape the tax collectors and go to the countryside. And as you all know, the one thing about the lovely university that I attend is Penn Siri racers. <laughs> they don't seem to be raced. Everything else is lovely. As you all know, the, the household, the large country house in Rome changed in structure. As we move toward the fourth century, the classic atrium with the wall over here it starts to turn into a castle. Now this castle was partly built in order to protect the large landowner from the, from the external barbarian invasion, which I haven't mentioned up now, have I? But it was also to protect them from the, from the tax collector. The problem Rome faced was this. The borders were militarized. The center of the empire was almost totally demilitarized. It was very difficult to collect from large landowners. Furthermore, large landowners were in a position to, and this will be no surprise, by their freedom from taxes, by paying the right people. Furthermore, their interests were not separate from the interests of those in the bureaucracy who also were large landowners. In short, the large landowners were able to escape paying taxes. And one of the elements involved in that is moving from the city to the country and hiring a set of people who were skilled in arms. Start to sound like feudal lords, don't they? Now, this leaves all the active artisans and tradesmen in the city in bad shape. There's no longer anybody supplying material from the countryside. They can't afford to pay taxes either because the urban marketplace is declining. What are they going to do? They're going to stay in the urban marketplace, urban environment, and starve? Well, their other alternative is to escape the domain of taxation of the political state by moving to the large estates in the country and inserting themselves, asking for the protection of the large of the Lord in the country from taxes and from the barbarians. Thus, they begin to acquire a, a lower status, but at the same time, the status of the slaves is going up from slave to serf. We now see that the rate of production in the country has undoubtedly declined. Now, that does not mean that the army couldn't be supported at all, but it does mean that the large landowners have no money. They might have some in a chest somewhere, but they have no way of acquiring more because they're no longer involved in marketplaces. They might have surpluses and could pay their taxes in kind, but paying taxes in kind is not the way to support a bureaucratic army or a bureaucratic civil bureaucracy. As you undoubtedly know, by the 6th century, the 7th century, even by the latter part of the 5th century, the solution to this was to, in fact, invite the barbarians in and have them play the role of the army, essentially more and more disestablishing the old Roman legion system and turning barbarian chieftains into kings by putting them, on the one hand, at the top of a civil bureaucracy and, on the other hand, turning having that, to a certain extent, turning their, their warrior bands into military bureaucracies, in short, into armies. Then they'd fight the other barbarians. At the same time, the legions of Rome were becoming themselves bar barbarized. They were becoming self-supporting because they couldn't support themselves from the tax rolls from the no longer existing cities. And thus we find Rome declining. Of course, taxes, the high tax rate, had an important role here. But of course, that wasn't all there was to it. It seems to me central, the central issue was the rate of coercion. 
and how that could be maintained. So it seems to me then that the ancient system, that is a system based on slavery, could in fact reproduce itself effectively best when the system expanded and ultimately could only reproduce itself when the system expanded. When the expansion stopped, the collapse began. The final question I want to ask is this. How do we know that the decline in the slave market had the structural effect that I claim it had? Why do we think we could be at all sure that that might be in any regards related to an explanation for the fall of Rome? Is there, in fact, on the one hand, any data that would support it? Well, there is, of course, data on the rate of movement of goods from country to city. And we see that there is an, at least a relationship between an apparent relationship between the existence of the slave market and the movement of goods. But is that good enough? I don't think it's good enough. I think, in fact, we need another element. And what I'm going to suggest is this. There's a way to check that argument. You can run an experiment. Now, I'm not going to suggest that we, that we take into our experimental lab whips and chains. I don't think we really have to do that. Because what we're basically arguing is this, that, in fact, there are two fundamentally different structures involved. And that the fundamental difference between the two structures is in the cost of confrontation for the coercer. It seems to me that the issue involved is not simply an issue of intensity of negative sanction. We could change that so that we could actually run an experiment where people pass counters back and forth. If, in fact, we could build two systems, one system in which there was a highly unequal distribution of the cost of confrontation, one in which, in fact, there was an interest on the part of a person playing the role of the master, though he's not told that, in transmitting a negative sanction or transmitting two negative sanctions. And if we could measure the rate of coercion in that system and then build another system in which, in fact, it was always costly to transmit negative sanctions, and measure the rate of coercion in that one. And if, in fact, there was a, there was a change, not a change, excuse me, in fact, there was a contrast. And if, in fact, under the first condition, the rate of coercion was relatively maximal, and under the second condition, it was, it was considerably less than it had been, then at least that would be consistent with this interpretation. Whether ultimately you want to buy that or not is quite another question. Now, in making that kind of argument, I don't mean to imply that there is necessarily any similarity in meaning systems in any very broad sense between people you'd study in a lab and ancient Romans and their slaves. I don't mean to imply that I'm trying to make a generalization either from Rome to a laboratory condition or from the laboratory condition to Rome. What instead I would like to say is this, that in fact, I can imagine two theoretic conditions of centralized coercive systems. One condition in which there's a differential allocation of the cost of confrontation, and the other in which that cost of confrontation is more evenly distributed. In the first circumstance, I would expect a high rate of coercion. In the second, I wouldn't. Now, so far, I haven't said anything about where it happened intentionally. That should happen under any conditions, then, that would satisfy certain other knowledge conditions. Well, in fact, I have to do a bunch of experiments. And the way that I ran the experiments looked something like this. I didn't really use the slave market, and now I'm sort of sorry that I didn't, because the analog would have been a little closer. What I did was this. The one system simply involved two people who were experimental subjects, and another experimental subject sitting here. These people were given a number of counters. 
dollar fix teepee. This person was given three counts. Ignore this. I'm not going to try to erase it because I'm going to come back to it. That's my second picture. If any one of these counters was transmitted down here, that would wipe out this person, the value this person had. So that's clearly a negative transfer. If this person transmitted any of these, any, these are divisible. He gets the one, two, three, four, five, six, up to ten he gets transmitted. Then this person would earn as much money as that person would have earned had that person been able to keep it. The following is immediately clear. Since if this person transmitted this negative down here, that'll wipe out everything. And this then clearly the most counters that this person would ever have an interest in transmitting is the nine. Transmitted ten might as well just as well let the person who's going to transmit the negative. On the other hand, at the other extreme, what's the least that this person could transmit? Obviously, one counter. So the rate of coercion can range between nine counters and one counter for this kind of a system. I might add that this was a system of negotiation. So it wasn't a very clean analog, but that shouldn't worry you too much. It was a system in which these people were not allowed to communicate with each other. And it was a system in which, if an agreement was reached here, then a certain, a certain number of the resources of this actor were transmitted up here, then it was not uh, allowed that this person could transmit the negative. What happened from that is exactly what you expect, a compromise system. They didn't, you never found nine transmitted, you never found one transmitted, what you found was four or five. Somewhere in there. And they negotiated very, very hard. And then we changed the system. We added two more people. And then we made a rule. This person's always got to transmit two to anybody. Always got to transmit two negative things. And you see what the effect of the rule was. The effect of the rule was precisely what you might imagine. It eliminated the cost of confrontation for those two transmissions. The question was who going to receive it. And the system ran about as you'd expect. This person would get offered. This person. Four. 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 Now, we have filled this maximum network. The guy says, four. He says, you're crazy. If you don't give me five, I'm going to transmit a negative sanction to you. So, or would you turn all of you zappy? He says, all right, five. This guy says, five. He says, five. Oops. These people are going to get it. Six. Six. Seven, eight, it went right up to nine. I rather suspect that that's exactly, the th and it, that's where I got the idea of an iteration process where you notice that system will not support bargaining. You can't bargain in a system like that. You can get shoved from one extreme to another, but you can't bargain. It won't sustain it. What happened in effect was we did not ask the central person to institute any rule. All we did was say, you got five, we actually gave them five instead of three. You got five of these sanctions, you got to pass two of them to somebody, anybody you want to, whenever you want to. In fact, the rule was developed individually by a great number of people who ran through this experiment, and they always developed the same rule. And as far as I can tell from reading Weber and some other sources, that's the same kind of rule that was used in classical Rome. But in fact, classical Roman masters apparently preferred cheap slaves. They thought they were sharper. It certainly was less costly to beat them. And with that preference for cheapness, the evidence of preference for low cost of confrontation. Will we ultimately know for sure why Rome fell? I don't know. But at least this much is clear. I think the more we, we know about the way structure affects human behavior, the more we'll understand any maintenance or change of a social structure. Well, thank you.